<clears throat> Good afternoon, class. Shall we bow our heads? Father, thank you so much for your blessings. Thank you for this privilege of coming again to study the history of your work. We are so grateful for the evidence of, of your guidance and pray that we may respond and, and uh, care, uh, receive the messages into our minds and hearts that you gave at that time. In the name of Jesus, amen. Well, class, I see you've survived the, uh, the fire. And uh, you, some of you may have wondered what happened to me. I, I, uh, well, they were facing evacuation for several hours, and I finally decided to leave and go visit my sister in, uh, in uh, Calistoga. So that's where I've spent the last few days. But it's good to be back, and this morning we will take up the lesson we would have taken up on Wednesday. And that is chapter 9 of the book Power of Humility, and the subject matter is time setting. <clears throat> You'll recall that uh, when Truth is denied. To deny truth is to invite heresy. And when the Minneapolis message was denied, the result was a, a number of heresies that met the church one right after another, <clears throat> which is the the uh, automatic result of rejecting truth. There were six heresies that emerged. I've covered five of them in this class. The other one you'll find in the book, uh, but it's one that related more to just a very small group of people or maybe mainly one person who developed the heresy. But all of the other heresies had an impact on the church. The one we're going to deal with today is still plaguing the church. I've had to deal with it time after time. Wherever I've been, I suppose nearly always in each pastorate, I've had at least some questions raised about uh, time prophecies. And uh, <clears throat> the result of failing to pass the test in the Minneapolis message left our people looking for keys to hurry the Lord's coming and for the latter rain that were not intended. So that the false answers to that question, the real answer to the question is to get back to the... Um, to the message of Minneapolis and apply its principles, which we will discuss again today. So when Butler and Smith, who led the church in rejecting the message, when they did, they left Wagner and Jones outside of God's protective priesthood of believers plan. It was God's intention for them to, uh, to meet with Jones and Wagner and to uh, study with them and to follow a priesthood to believer plan which would have meant that they would unite together to study God's word and seek to find unity in truth. Instead, they outright rejected their message, sought to shut them down, and in doing so, placed them in a relationship to church authority, which was very bad, because church authority is God's own ordained plan for governing his church. 
And when those who were in authority misused their authority, it's the worst thing that could happen. And instead of encouraging that plan of God, which is always new issues are to be studied together, leading men are to come together and study those issues prayerfully and seeking the Holy Spirit's guidance, studying God's word to determine what is true. Instead, Jones and, uh, I should say, instead, uh, Butler and Smith assumed that they already knew what was true, accused Wagner and Jones of teaching heresy and sought to close them down. And the result was not only that the church was left in danger, but the very messengers, Wagner and Jones, were placed in a very bad position in relationship to the church. It is through the corrective support uh, of priesthood of believers that Christ disciplines and perfects his people. This is how God intends to lead his people, allowing them to, to uh, face questions in which they may have differences of understanding, but the responsibility is not to impose their own view, but to come humbly together to seek God's direction and to be directed by the Holy Spirit. So the result of Butler and Smith failing to do that was that uh, ultimately Wagner and Jones themselves left the church and their light went out. The church itself faced a half dozen heresies. By priesthood practices, the Holy Spirit offered to unite us in truth, protect us against heretical attacks, against various heresies, and to give us the light and love that are to fill the earth with God's glory. That message was intended to cause the light, and light of God, which is, comes from his love, to be spread around the world. Instead, the church was almost split apart into many pieces by rapidly occurring heresies. Paul speaks of the coming of the lawless one. He's speaking in his day, the first century. He speaks of him coming with all power, signs and lying wonders and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not what? The love of the truth, that they should be saved. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusions that they should believe a lie. The result of rejecting truth is to invite error. And uh, this is what the church was faced with, not one error or two or three, but half dozen errors. And each one claimed its own uh, respondents. To resist truth then is to invite heresy. By priesthood of believer practices, the Holy Spirit inspires the vertical relationship to God and places us in a horizontal relation to God's Christ's body to teach us humility and to develop in us humble, loving relations. Now this is God's plan then, priesthood of believers, is God's workshop. It is his purpose and his plan through the priesthood of believers for us to humble ourselves one to another, humble ourselves to God and call for the Holy Spirit, seek his guidance to unite us. Our purpose in facing new ideas or even heresy should always be that of unity, not to prove ourselves correct, but to seek 
the Holy Spirit's presence as we say, seek the Word of God, the principles of God's Word to unite us. To resist or neglect discipline of the body is to resist the spirit through whom the head directs and perfects us. Now, I've mentioned the head a couple of times here. The head, of course, is Christ. He is the head, and we are the body. And unless there is a proper priesthood of believer process, the head becomes separated from the body. Because it is in this process that the body maintains its relationship with the head and seeks to be guided by the head who directs it through the Holy Spirit. So when that happens, it leaves us to confuse our own impulses with the Holy Spirit's voice. If we're not hearing the Spirit, we're hearing some other spirit. And actually we hear our own impulses and desires that seem to us to be evidences of the Holy Spirit's guidance. When we are truly seeking truth, God will protect us from that. You remember Paul says that the, uh, for this cause God shall send them strong delusions that they should believe a lie. If we choose to disregard truth, we're choosing to believe a lie. God will not protect us from that which we choose. If we choose to reject light in that very process, we've asked for darkness. And the darkness of error is surely to come. It is through the Holy Spirit that Christ unites the vertical that is, lights individually, unites us with himself so that we commune with him and reunites us with the body. Unless we're united to the head and to the body, we are not of Christ. We are Christ's because we're part of his body and connected and under the direction of the head. And as a result, as we mentioned before, the heresies begin. We will now discuss the first of those heresies. Blindness led to misinterpretation. So when we close our eyes to truth, what happens? We become blind. And when we are blind, the result is that we misinterpret and misunderstand and we develop false doctrines from Scripture itself, assuming that we must be scriptural because it's, there's, there is the Scripture. and We think we're in, in the Scripture when we're not in the Scripture. Now, there's a statement we will now consider that has been used by nearly all of those who are what we call time-setters or those who project Daniel's prophecies into the future. And that uh, passage is found in Testimonies to Ministers, page 114, and it reads this way. When the books of Daniel and Revelation are better understood, believers will have an entirely different religious experience. What do you suppose about better understanding Daniel Revelation will lead to a new experience, a different experience? What, what would you think would, would, would be the answer to that? Seeing Christ in them? Pardon? Seeing Christ in them? Seeing Christ in them, yes. Time setters take this as their uh, jumping, uh, are their springboard. And they say, well, what, we, what do we find in Daniel Revelation that will make a difference in our experience? Now, it is true that when they start setting time, it does create an excitement. We'll find out a little later that that's not what Ellen White was talking about. 
something that makes a difference in character and experience, not just something that makes a difference in emotions. And the result of this passage is that scores of people have taken this to mean that they need to find something in then Revelation that will excite them and get get things going. And so what they find, take the time prophecies, they decide that those time prophecies that are already fulfilled on a year for a day basis, a day for a year basis, uh, are to be fulfilled again on a day for a day basis. And so they say, well, uh, it's true that the 1260 years has been fulfilled. But maybe God plans to fulfill the 1260 days on a literal daily basis. And so they begin speculating. As a result, their minds are taken away from God's plan. Speculation on Daniel's time prophecy began very soon at the rejection of Minneapolis. There had been time speculation before, and we'll find that Ellen White had dealt with that repeatedly before. But now, here it comes again because they're quite sure that this will excite the church. This will give them a different experience. And so, uh, it is that Ellen White did not call upon the, dis the church to re apply the time prophecies, but urge the focus on Christ and his righteousness. Actually, she urged a focus on the Minneapolis message. The Minneapolis message was a message that focused on Christ and his righteousness. And by that we mean, not only did it focus on Christ, but his substitutionary death and his resurrection to offer us his own righteousness, by which alone we can pass through the judgment. Now it is true that that righteousness is intended to transform our lives, but the basis for our passing through the judgment is Christ's righteousness, not our own. It becomes our own by assimilation, it becomes our own, but the Bible says, by beholding we become changed. By continually beholding Christ, our minds and our hearts are transformed. But the basis for our entry into the kingdom and the basis for our preparation for that is to behold Christ, who is a central figure of both Daniel and Revelation. If we had time, we could spend a little time uh, doing that, but I challenge you to look through Daniel, check and see how many times it refers to Christ. By the way, it never refers to him by, by the name Christ or Jesus. It refers to him by symbolic representation, Prince of Princes, for instance, a uh, uh, prince of the host, uh, various uh, symbolic expressions. But there are about, if I remember right, there are about 15. Uh, he also, in, just in chapter 7, 8, and 9. But in chapter 2, we find him already presented as the Son of Man. And Son of Man... And by the way, that's the first place in the Bible Christ is referred to as the Son of Man. When Christ, throughout his ministry, referred to himself as the Son of Man, he was always referring to his role as portrayed in Daniel. But revelation begins. It's a revelation of what? Of Jesus Christ. So, what is it about Daniel and Revelation that must be better understood? Christ, our righteousness. What is the Minneapolis theme? 
Christ our righteousness. So actually, in calling attention to Daniel Revelation, Ellen White was calling attention to the message of Minneapolis, the message which had been rejected, but which must yet be internalized, understood and internalized. And this, by the way, is what she means by when the books of Daniel and Revelation are better understood, when we understand that they are portrayals of Christ himself, that the main theme of these books is Christ. And when we understand that the theme of Christ is his substitutionary death, he is our substitute and our what? Surety. Surety. That's right. Substitute means he takes our sins upon himself. We do not have to deal with our sins. We give them to him in confession and he receives them and takes responsibility for them. And then he gives us a surety that he will be there to, to the end. He is the Alpha and the Omega. He is the beginner and the finisher of our faith. He is the one alone who can prepare us for his coming. And when that principle of Daniel Revelation is better understood, we will have internalized the very principles of the Minneapolis message and prepared for the Holy Spirit to be poured out in a marked measure. There will be a difference in the religious experience that will permit God to pour out his Holy Spirit upon us. But instead, futurism developed in which they claimed that the real, the real key to the Holy Spirit's coming is to believe that the, there is a yet a day for a day uh, fulfillment to take place. September 5, 1891, less than three years after Minneapolis, Ellen White warned against the setting of time uh, in her sermon in Lansing, Michigan. This, <clears throat> she says, instead of exhausting the powers of our mind in speculations in regard to the times and seasons, which the Lord has placed in his own power, which means he has at his own command. He has not shown us, but that is something he is responsible for and is withheld from men. We are to yield ourselves to the control of the Holy Spirit, to do present duties, to give the bread of life unadulterated with human opinions to souls who are perishing for the truth. So ministry is extremely important as we study the life of Christ. Our challenge is to internalize those principles and share them with others. But the leaders misled by resisting the truth as it is in Jesus. Now this is a, another way of labeling the Minneapolis message. The truth as it is where? In Jesus. By the way, we can have all the doctrines, but we may not have the message. If we do not have the truth as it is in Jesus, if every truth does not focus our minds upon him, then to us it becomes a deception. We're deceived into thinking we have what we do not have. The Minneapolis message is not a doctrine, it's not a theology, it's an experience. It's a description of the experience that God wants his people to have and will have when they're prepared for the falling of the latter rain. We must work as Christians. If we have any point that is not fully, clearly defined and cannot bear the test of criticism, don't be afraid or too proud to yield it. 
We want the truth as it is in Jesus. We want to be filled with all the fullness of God and have the meekness and lowliness of Christ. Now, <clears throat> this is interesting because the truth as it is in Jesus, Ellen White repeatedly uh, states what we find in the Minneapolis, the reason why Smith and Butler rejected this message is because they thought they already had it. They had all the truths, but they didn't have the truth as it was in Jesus. When I was a young man, and by the way, I grew up, at 15 years old I was converted when God led me to set aside one hour every morning and one hour every evening to study and pray. And what did I take? I was led to take Desire of Ages. Every morning, an hour. Every, every evening, an hour. Seven days a week. Fourteen hours a, a week. That's quite a lot of time when you have it every week, week after week. I prayed through Desire of Ages. I didn't just read it. I prayed through it. And that resulted in the transformation of my life that I was looking for but didn't know how to find. For eight years I tried to figure out how to, to become approved of God. And now I'm reading Desire of Ages which focuses on what Christ does for me, not what I have to do to be approved of Him. I prayed through Desire of Ages twice during that same year, which meant that my theology was established several years before I went to college. I was, at that point, I was a sophomore in academy. That book, I didn't realize it until a few years ago, I suddenly realized that book is a systematic treatment of the Minneapolis message. The Minneapolis message took place in, well, at Minneapolis was 1888. The book wasn't published until 10 years later, but all those years it was in process. And in the process of Desire of Ages, we have Christ's Object Lessons. Uh, by the way, Steps to Christ was in between uh, Christ's Object Lessons, Mount of Blessings, uh, at least one or two chapters of Ministry of Healing, a large work. And last of all was Desire of Ages. Mount of Blessings was published in uh, 1896 and uh, Desire of Ages in 1898. Why were, did, were there so many books? Well, <laughs> it was far too big to be put in one book. The book Desire of Ages, I don't know if you know it, but it's, it's 800 pages. That's a large book. And Christ's Object Lessons, I believe, is 600 pages. And then, of course, there's Mount of Blessings, which is smaller, but it is also, a, a, you know, a significant little book. I consider it, I, t I speak of it as the biggest little book in the world. It is a powerful book. What is Steps to Christ? It's a summary of the Minneapolis principles. Desire of Ages is a systematic treatment of Minneapolis principles. Those principles were not uh, introduced by Wagner, by the way. They were introduced long before by Ellen White. Those principles were evident, and you can see them, especially in, in, in Volume 5, where you have uh, uh, three sections of that book. One of them was published in uh, 1890, uh, 19, pardon me, 1882, the second one in 1885, and the last one in 1889. During the period of time where this issue had been discussed in the church, 
Minneapolis was the climax, but there had been several years of, of discussion. But where did Wagner get his message? Wagner had a vision while listening to Ellen White's message. Now, I'm telling you this not on the basis of what I've studied and researched, but what I know is true. Ellen White was teaching that camp meeting season was presenting Christ crucified. I am sure as I can be, that was her primary theme, had been for years. And when he, she was preaching of Christ crucified, Wagner suddenly saw the cross lifted up and saw Christ on the cross and realized for the first time in his life that Christ died for him. And had, as he explained later, the first time he had confidence that his sins were taken care of because Christ died in his place. He died as a substitute for him and for you and me. It was this message, a message which Wagner had really been receiving for years from Ellen White, but did not grasp that he suddenly was focused on his mind in such a way as to transform his whole pattern of thinking and cause him to leave the medical work and become a pastor. This was the origin of the Minneapolis message. In other words, God gave that message and was giving it to Ellen White. Ellen White mentioned that for 40 years she had been giving that message, and she had been. You can, you can see it. But now that it is open, it is enunciated, and Ellen White's great desire was that the people would receive it. And from that point on, the main burden of her life was that the Minneapolis message be received. And Steps to Christ was her first published expression of it. How many of you have studied through the book Steps to Christ? Most of you. How many times? How many have done it <laughs> two or three times? If you if you've done it four or five times, do it again. It's worth your time. That little book has power. It's, it's, uh, it's such a simple way of expressing the principles of Minneapolis. And of course, Desire of Ages, wonderful book, but it takes many hours to read, 800 pages. And Christ's Object Lessons, I finished uh, the Acts of the Apostles. I read Desire of Ages and then the Acts of Apostles, and I finished that while I was in, in Canada, but I hadn't taken another book, so I reread Acts of Apostles with profit. It's amazing how much you can get from that book. And I was planning to take Christ's Object Lessons next, but I, mean, I forgot I had planned that and started with Great Controversy, so I'm worried. I'm, I'm reading Great Controversy again. But when I finish, I want to take, take Christ's Object Lessons. That is a tremendous book. And it is also a part of the Desire of Ages work. So the, they're all a part of Ellis White's presenting those beautiful pic, uh, principles which she presented from the beginning of her ministry but was intensified by the Minneapolis focus. And from that point on, Ellen White's great burden was the acceptance of the Minneapolis message. However, in 1901, she told the people clearly, she said, because of insubordination on the part of the church, we would have to re wait, remain in this world for many long years. And that's what she was talking about, the rejection of the Minneapolis message because of insubordination, a refusal to accept 
that which God gave us, we would have to undergo instead many, many heretical challenges and many trials. We are today, in fact, tomorrow is the time set for fall council to discuss the women's ordination issue. That issue would not have been discussed at all if we had accepted the Minneapolis message. But I want to invite you to be praying earnestly. The, the um, leaders of those who are, are uh, opposing the process uh, have asked us to make that a day of prayer. So I invite you to consider that, uh, making tomorrow a day of special prayer, that, that God will lead our leaders in the right way. We're facing a very severe trial because God's plan for men and women is clearly indicated by the way in which he created men and women and by his organization, uh, his organizational plan throughout the period of patriarchs and then throughout the entire national history of Israel and New Testament time and throughout the New Testament. Yet they say there's no biblical evidence one way or another. And there are at least some who are urging that they decide it simply on the matter of ecclesiological principles, uh, which uh, they uh, hope will result in, in their fond dream. Brothers and sisters, we cannot reject God's word and be directed by God. We rejected Minneapolis' message and have paid for it. We're still paying for it. This is God's opportunity for us to repent. And we need to pay, pray for that repentance. The focus was not to be on time speculation, but on Christ, our righteousness. That was the purpose. That was the message of Ellen White. When the books of Daniel and Revelation are better understood, how are they to be better understood? Well, we already understood the time prophecies and they were already fulfilled. But the time prophecies were not the primary purpose of Daniel and Revelation. They were to lead us to Christ. And, and this is what will transform the church. It will be found that those who bear false messages will not have a high sense of honor. She's speaking of the time setters and integrity. They will deceive the people and mix up their error with the testimonies of Sister White and use her name to give influence to their work. They make such selections from the testimonies as they think they can twist to support their positions and place them in a setting of falsehood. If they did that while she was alive, what would you expect afterward? Well, this is being done all the time. And those who come out with new uh, ideas and theories and so forth nearly always use Ellen White's statements, but they misuse them. They use them in the wrong context and they misinterpret them. Theories and calculations disqualify for giving the third angel's message. Satan wants us to be disqualified for giving that message. Therefore, he does everything he can to confuse our thinking. Satan is ever ready to fill the mind with theories and calculations that will divert men from present truth. What is present truth? That is right. Who is there as their substitute and surety? Those two principles, Christ our righteousness, means Christ our substitute. He took our sins to give us his righteousness. 
and our surety, and the surety is that he will not let us perish. As long as we look to him, we will be saved. There is no way of being lost if we look to Christ. Looking into Jesus, the author and the what? Finisher of what? Of our faith. Satan is ever ready to fill the mind with theories and calculations that will divert men from present truth and disqualify them for giving the third angel's message to the world. What is Satan's plan? What is his constant uh, effort? To disqualify us for giving that message. How does he disqualify it? For causing us to deal with theories and calculations. Now, Theories covers a large area, but what does calculations mean? Calculations has to do with mathematics, has to do with time setting. We will in continual danger, Ellen White says, of getting above the simplicity of the gospel. I have been greatly distressed that many times people who focus on the Minneapolis message have developed a very um, complex theology. Brothers and sisters, the truth is simple. Don't ever let anyone think that you have to have some complex reasoning in order to understand Minneapolis. Minneapolis is very simple, and it's so simple that it's simply that Jesus is our righteousness. He's our righteousness now. He'll be our righteousness in the judgment. Christ, our righteousness. How do we receive his righteousness? By receiving him. When we are in Christ, then we are judged where and how? in him as based upon his righteousness. Those who are in Christ are already perfect. Does that mean that they live without flaws? No. The fact is that while we're in Christ, we are regarded by God as though we had never sinned. So, our effort to become perfect, we need to be careful about this. Our effort to be perfect really must begin with the commitment to Christ, our righteousness. We begin by being perfect. How am I perfect to begin with? By his perfection. I claim his perfection. He receives me and identifies me with his perfection, and the Father himself sees us as though we had not sinned. Now, does that mean because we have already overcome every temptation? No. We receive his perfection. He's the author and finisher. When he begins in, in, in uh, Philippians 1.6, being confident of this very thing, that he which has begun a good work in you will perform it into the day of Jesus Christ. Who's responsible for fulfilling it? Are we responsible? Who's responsible for preparing us for the latter rain? Christ is responsible. However, our, responsible, our response to his responsibility is very important. Because we are in crisis by our choice. We're in Christ by our choice. We choose to receive Christ in choosing to receive him. We choose to receive his character. And we choose to live by his character. Who then becomes responsible for the result? He does. We cannot be responsible because we cannot do it. There is no righteousness in ourselves. Self cannot overcome self. So, we overcome by faith 
in Christ our righteousness. That means that we overcome when we understand that Christ is our righteousness. For eight years, I tried to prove myself to God. There's no way for me to prove myself to God. If I had spent 80 years, I still could not have done so. Or 800 years or whatever. There's no way. But by choosing to claim his substitutionary righteousness and his assurity. His surety is what causes me to be confident that even though I'm weak, I can become strong. And though I am failing in my own strength, I can gain the victory. Whatever he bids me to do, he will see to it. His biddings are his enablings. <clears throat> now I'm just uh, uh, coming to the latter part of this experience promised from a study of Daniel Revelation it was not a state of spiritual ecstasy but character transformation by a deepening relationship to the Lord our righteousness it is Christ's righteousness that transforms us not our own in the same article that we've just read from, Ellen White says, spiritual knowledge will never develop in any line that will lead us to imagine that we may know the times and the seasons which our Father had put in his own power, which we've already found out means withheld from us. Again and again I have been warned in regard to time setting. There will never again be a message for the people of God that would be based on time. We are not to know the definite time either for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit or for the coming of Christ. A second article quotes from a letter which she had, in which she had placed some of her former writings and placed the mark January 21, 1851, preserve carefully. Now, we're going to be dealing with that letter again later in terms of, that is the circumstance of that letter in terms of the daily, which is an issue we will discuss a little later. God has not revealed when the outpouring of the Holy Spirit will take place, this letter stated. Uh, it was published in 1892, but she read it from this, she repeated it, quoted it from this letter that she had preserved from 41 years before, 1851. A third article, April 5, 1892, notice how frequent these are. We started with 91, now we're several already in 92. It says, the article warns against diverting the mind from the all-important theme of righteousness by faith. The true focus of Daniel and Revelation. Do not allow your minds to be diverted from the all-important theme of the righteousness of Christ by the study of theories. Now, she's repeatedly spoken of theories and calculations. She's talking about time speculation. How to test the new light? We contrast it with the simplicity of the Minneapolis theme, the righteousness of Christ. And this against the theories that divert the mind from that same theme. Satan still fosters various theories to detract the mind from Minneapolis. And these theories are abroad today. Ellen White's first Review and Herald article after the series that we've just been discussing refers again to the times and the seasons. So she's finished her series, but she's not finished discussing the issue. 
times and seasons the Father has put in his own power, identifying surrender of the will to truth. Now remember, the failure of Minneapolis was to surrender the will to the truth as a key to transforming power. Jesus said, you will know the truth, and the truth shall what? Make you free. Truth has power to transform the life if it's received in faith and acted upon. She calls this the third angel's message, resistance to which spawned the false theories. And by the way, she called the Minneapolis message the third angel's message in verity. A year and a half later, Ellen White repeats, all, let all our brethren and sisters beware of anyone who would set a time for the Lord to fulfill his word in regard to his coming or in regard to any other promise he has made of special significance. Therefore, there is not to be any time speculation regarding any issue of the scriptures. It is not for you to know the times of the seasons which the Father has put in his power, she repeats in 1893. Brief selections of Ellen White and the Bible are still cited in a way to violate these principles. She is, she is very concerned about it. In the same article, she also says false teachers may appear to be very zealous for the work of God. But as they mingle error with truth, their message is one of deception and will lead souls into false paths. They are to be met and opposed, not because they are bad men, but because they are teachers of falsehood. Now, it's amazing to me that we still have people who spend their lifetime at Seventh-day Adventists trying to get the church to accept their futuristic ideas about reapplying the messages of the past into the future on a day-for-day -day basis. When Ellen White has made it so clear, and the article we're going to study on the Daily, was written in 1851, repeats this over and over again, there will never again be, and that's 1851, long before 1880s, Never again be a message based on time. Futurism, which we've been discussing, by the way, those who are involved in time setting will resist the idea that it's futurism. It is futurism, even though they claim to believe in the traditional day for a year principle that has already been fulfilled by reinterpreting it to the future, this is futurism. And furthermore, it was this way that, uh, that J. N. Darby started and, his, and the British Isles, the Brethren. And it wasn't long before they rejected everything but the futurism. And this has happened again and again and again. Without my consent, they made selections from the testimonies to make it appear that my writings sustain and approve the position they advocate. In times past, many others have done the same thing and have made it appear that testimony sustained positions that were untenable and false. The truth is misapplied and rested by its connection with error. So don't worry about how many passages of scripture or Ellen White statements may be quoted if they are denying the principles she here uh, enunciates, you must never pay any attention to them because they are false. Uh, the next week, Ellen White again warned, it will be found that those who bear false messages will not have a high sense of honor and integrity. They will deceive the people and mix up their error uh, the, the error uh, with their error, testimonies of Sister White, and use her name to give influence to their work. They make such selections from the testimonies that they think they can twist to support their positions and place them in a setting of falsehood. 
This was from Review and Herald, 1893. Now, these statements are very, very similar to, to the ones, uh, the one we've just read from the previous week, but this shows the intensity of concern on the part of Ellen White, who said <coughs> in the uh, later uh, manuscript, she says, I have not been able to sleep past half past one o'clock. I was bearing a to Brother Bell, John Bell, a message which the Lord had given me for him. John Bell is the one that she was dealing with all the time. John Bell was the one who introduced this view and was still spreading it despite her intense efforts. This shows the character of the man, Ellen White. He's using her works now to prove his theories when she is declaring directly that these are misapplying and misrepresenting her uh, words. The great, I uh, say, the peculiar views he holds are a mixture of truth and error. And by the way, that is what heresy is. It's always a mixture of truth and error. Heresy could not get off the ground. It couldn't fly if it didn't have truth there to cause people to have some confidence in it. The tree of knowledge of good and evil was a tree of truth and error. And that's what heresy is. The great uh, mixture of truth and error, the great waymarks of truth showing us our bearings in prophetic history are to be carefully guarded lest they be torn down and replaced with the theories that would bring confusion rather than genuine light. I have been cited to the very erroneous theories that have been pres presented over and over again. Those who advocated these theories presented scripture quotations, but they misapplied and misinterpreted them. Ellen's two, Ellen White's twofold concern was the misrepresentation and the reapplying of time prophecies of Daniel Revelation. A, this displaces the Minneapolis focus, the first problem. This is how God, this is how Satan was trying to, to forever destroy. He had caused the leaders to reject it. However, many of the members were receiving this message and now he has a way of harvesting the members by having this message of, of time setting circulated throughout the church. It displaces the Minneapolis message and it obscures the scenes connected with the man of sin. In other words, by that, this is what uh, Darby did actually, is to deny eventually the papal apostasy entirely. <coughs> Yet her very warnings are so twisted as to justify in her name reapplying time prophecies that overshadow Christ our righteousness. Now Ellen White speaks of the events that leading down to the close of this earth's history. And this expression is used by many a time setter, showing that there are still events Going, we haven't gone down to the close of history yet, so, so she's, the, the idea is that there are time prophecies that, that we need to be a, applying leading down to the close of history. These are used to defend future time prophecies. Yet this 1896 article echoes the 1892 warning against any time setting. She says, projecting time prophecy into the future undermines faith in God's leading in the past. Ellen clearly warns, there will never again be a message for the people of God that would be based upon time. Never again is pretty inclusive. Now, <clears throat> the tale of two Fords. One Ford you know about Desmond Ford. The other Ford was Dr. John Ford. Does anyone here know who John Ford was? 
Okay, did you know what Dr. Ford or his wife, Elora? Uh, okay, but you knew who he was. All right. Uh, I'm not sure just how much we have left to cover, but I'm going to take a little time to tell you the story. When I was at Pacific Union, that is, I was in the Pacific Union College area to do my dissertation, uh, I was teaching a Sabbath school at, at Deer Park. In that Sabbath school was Elora Ford, that is John Ford's wife, uh, was her parents. And they had appreciated my teaching in that class. And one day they asked me, they said, now, our daughter is married to Dr. John Ford, and they have developed some new ideas. Would you be willing to go uh, with us to their home and evaluate their ideas? Well, of course I was willing, and they wanted to take me rather than to tell me how to get there and so forth, so I went with them. After having spent a couple of hours with John and Elora Ford, we left. As we got in the car, we hadn't much more than gotten started, and, and uh, Elora's mother asked, what did you think? Well, what's, your, what's your evaluation? Well, I really wasn't too eager to tell what I thought to Elora's mother, but it was obvious to me in the time we spent together and the questions I asked that they were that what they had was pure speculation. At this point, I did not know that they were involved in time speculation. It was other issues that we were talking about. But how did I know that it was speculation? It was very simple. When I would ask for their evidence, they would simply tell me what God had done and shown them. Now, it's wonderful to have a testimony of what God has done, but our testimony must always be based on Scripture. Unless teachings are based on Scripture, we should have no confidence in them, no matter how wonderful they seem. And the only answers that, and by the way, I found that Elora Ford was the spokesman. John Ford was involved occasionally in the discussion, but she was the upfront one. But no matter what people teach, if they base it on their experience and not upon Scripture, you have a right to ask them, where is the Scripture? Because truth is based, we determine truth by Scripture, not by somebody's experience. Satan can create all kinds of experiences and lead people to believe that God is leading them when maybe he is leading them. Uh, so that, that was the first time. Several months later, Elora's mother came to me and said, uh, uh, Elora and John have sold their practice and uh, they are uh, planning to go preach their message until the Lord comes. And according to them, they knew that the last period had already started, that the last three and a half, uh, that is, uh, 1,260 days had already started, which would be three and a half years, literal years, according to them. Well, then she asked me, would you be willing to come to our house and, and talk with them? Well, yes, I was willing to. I was, went with fear and trembling because I knew from before that this was not going to be an easy task. When I got to their home, they were there already, and we became involved in discussion, 
And it was only a few minutes after I got there that she began uh, attacking me. And by attacking me, she was attacking all the ministers of the, of the Adventist church. You, when she was saying you, it was plural. You and other ministers. You do this. You do that. You do the other thing. And uh, it was impossible for me to, uh, to have any, any meaningful discussion with her. So finally, I just told her, I said, uh, Elora, we are to test the spirits, whether they're of God. The spirit that I find in you this evening is not the spirit of God. And uh, I left soon after that, feeling very de depressed because I had failed to accomplish anything with them. I had shared a number of principles with them. I'd hoped would help them to re-study their issue, but it, it, it was just, she countered my uh, message, my uh, evidence with just attacks. So I got home. I was just walking in the door and the bell was ringing. Uh, the, not the bell, but the phone. I answered the phone and she was, this was Elora's mother, was on the line. So grateful for my visit. They had been, for months, had been trying to, this is their own family, and they were trying to believe them, but they couldn't. And uh, what Elora did was sufficient to convince them that they were not under the right spirit. Well, they left, planning to be preaching this message until Christ came, because they knew that it was less than three years now, the interesting thing is that uh, Ellen White speaks about not being able to point to any certain time. So they refused to talk about any particular time, but they said they knew that the time had started. They didn't actually spell out when, but it was some time before, therefore it's less than three years. Well, it wasn't long before they were back again, bought another practice. He went into practice and practiced there until he died. But they, they were certain the Lord was coming in less than three years. And that has been, well, by now that's been almost 10 times that long. Uh, that's been, well, about, um, 1980, 1979 or 80. So you can see it's about 34 years. So it's more than 10 times, or about that, three and a half years. Well, young folk, <clears throat> I've told that story. Elora is still alive, and I hope she doesn't hear this, because I'm not meaning to criticize her. But when we are not led by the Spirit of God, we are led by another spirit. And I would hope that whatever experience Laura's had since then has, has changed her thinking. Her husband died several years ago. She's still alive. And a very fine woman, I'm sure, but, but uh, we must beware of deception. And remember that to deny truth is to invite heresy without any question. Ellen White continued through 96, by this time it's five years, she continued to warn against reapplication. Notice this, from the light that the Lord has been chosen, has, from the light that the Lord has been pleased to give me, you are in danger of presenting before others truths which have had their place and done their specific work in the time, for the time. You recognize these facts in Bible history as true, 
but apply them to the future. They have therefore still in their proper place in the chain of events that have made us uh, as a people what we are today. And such as, and as such, they are to be presented to those who are in the darkness of error. You and the others of our brethren must accept the truth as God has given it to his students of prophecy. That which was to them testing truth is testing truth to all to whom the message is proclaimed. Now that was 1896. We have now gone through the first of five heresies that we'll be discussing here, six heresies altogether. So there are really, I have here five to go. There'll be four that we will be doing in the future. Now, <clears throat> three other heresies developed a little bit later, but we will deal with all but one of those heresies. And that heresy, I'll probably speak a little bit about it, but basically that heresy, I see I have two minutes left. <laughs> that heresy is the heresy that God plans a specific mate for everyone. That few people uh, get the right mate to start with. But that those who become very close to Christ can know who that person was and can have a special relationship to them here and be married to them in the new earth. Now that by the way, is a very serious heresy. We will not be discussing that one. That one is far out. It was basically Wagner who was justifying his own position of falling in love with his secretary. This was his way of justifying his course. Uh, but we will discuss the other four heresies. Shall we bow our heads? Father, thank you for your many blessings. Thank you for leading us in spite of our confusion and that you have held your hand over this movement <clears throat> all this time waiting for us to understand, to internalize, <clears throat> and be transformed by the Minneapolis message. I pray that you'll teach us how it is to apply to our own lives that we may experience that message and that we may be humbled in the dust. In the name of Jesus, amen.